one thing we can be sure of in life is that we will all face uh, challenges and difficulties and hardship. And as we go through those, we can find ourselves uh, getting ground down and beat up and wondering what in the world is going on. Why is God allowing this in my life? And it can go all over the place from why did my uh, loved one die at such a young age? Why do I or one of my family members have to go through this health crisis? Why did I lose my job? Why am I in this financial difficulty that I face and the rug pulled out from underneath me? Why are my children uh, wayward in a situation? Why is there struggles with homosexual desires in my life or in the life of someone I love and care about? And how do I deal with that? And what about addictions in our lives or family struggles and my marriage is so difficult? And, and on we go. I think, wow. And we just get ground down and beat up and wonder what's going on. And certainly there are no easy answers to why that we ask, but I can say this confidently that God can and will use these circumstances to mold us, to shape us, to mature us, to be the people that he desires us to be. And, and my hope and long today is that you'll be, all of us will be encouraged, because I know there's no one exempt here. We all have struggles. We all have issues that uh, from the past or we're going through right now. And I hope is that we're encouraged as uh, we leave here today going, okay, I understand a little better how God can, can use this to uh, experience, in essence, uh, a new beginning in my life. You know, we're looking at a guy today that has uh, he's gone through many ups and downs and all over the board in his, in his life, and, and there's times I'm sure he just wanted to crawl into a hole, and he, he, times he just growled and said, you know, I, forgive me, God, for how I have lived. And I listen to Christians over the years, and we study him, and people go, man, that guy was a real goofball, you know, and he just did some of the dumbest things and said some of the dumbest things, and and yet what we see in the end of his life, which is amazing, is you see this guy who is mature and bold and confident and stepping out in faith in, in absolutely uh, amazing, amazing ways. And, uh, you know, we've talked about, uh, if you've been here this month, we've talked about new beginnings. And we talked about uh, Gideon and the Israelites experiencing new beginning. We talked about Manasseh and the evil guy, and he experienced new beginnings. And last week we talked about Legion and this man who's demon-possessed, and he experiences new beginning. And all these folks were like a kind of a, a short moment or a short season where all of a sudden they had a new beginning in their walk with God. Uh, today's story is, is not that. It's about a guy who, through all the ups and downs through life, uh, he ends up kind of experiencing, in essence, a new beginning through maturity in his walk with God. And that's what that's Christian life is. You know, we have the new beginning we can mark, but there's just these seasons we go through, ups and downs, victories, defeats, successes, failures, that uh, lead us to, or can lead us to, a maturity in our life. James chapter 1, passage you're familiar with, this is New Living, kind of states it differently, it declares this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect, or the words mature and complete and needing or, or lacking nothing. Um, this is a reality in uh, this man's life, and it can be a reality in each of our lives here today. Uh, so if you're coming here and you say, man, my life is, is really difficult, and uh, I'm struggling, I'm worn out with all the trials, uh, you're in a great spot whether you know it or not, because you're on the path towards, you can be on the path towards growing, maturing, and being all these things that are talked about in James, James chapter 1. So I'd urge you to, that's the good news. Listen up, be encouraged, and say, okay, I'm gonna, God can use this in my life today and uh, in the situations I'm going through, the situations I've, I've gone through. We're looking at the life of Peter, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at his, uh, his kind of his end of life, and saying, here's, man, this guy really, he was mature, and here's some things, here's marks of a mature believer for, through four kind of snapshots, or four pictures, and then we're going to look back in his life, and we're going to say, okay, man, we look back, and we see, here's places where he really was up and down and all around, and through those circumstance situations, it led to the end results. So we're kind of going to look at the end product and say, this is where we want to end up, and how did Peter, how in the world did he end up there? So we got 10, we got 10 stories, so we're going to have to cruise, Okay. We're going to put it, put it on a little, uh, little speed here and look at these snapshots and say, uh, hey, here's what we see, 
And some of them were going to make applications. Some were just going to kind of say, here's what happened in Peter's, Peter's life. But I want to look at the, the end of his life and snapshots of a, a spiritually mature follower of Jesus. Here's, here's markers of, of, of a mature believer. And you look at um, snapshot one, he's a, he's a bold proclaimer uh, of the good news. At the end of his life, and before that, I'm not saying he wasn't, but he, at the end of his life, he's a bold proclaimer of the good news of Jesus. You see that in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. Right after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's come, and uh, people are observing, and some of them are astonished, some of them are amazed, and some of them are perplexed, some of them are going, these guys are drunk, you know? And so what Peter does is he steps out of the crowd, and he, uh, he, he shouts to the crowd, and he says, listen carefully, all of you fellow uh, Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No matter what you see, no, no, what you see, excuse me, was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And he goes on and he quotes Joel. We're not going to look at all that. You jump down in chapter two of Acts, and he says, listen, people of Israel, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and he, his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in, in its grip. I mean, this is the wonderful news of Jesus. He came for us. He died for us. He was buried. He resurrected. And that's what Peter's proclaiming boldly to these folks. And uh, so he's saying, hey, let everyone know uh, what's going on here. And uh, that he, you crucified both the Lord and the Messiah. And listen, look at verse 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you see verse uh, 41. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000. I mean, he's proclaiming the gospel, and God is moving by his spirit, and it goes in the next chapter down the road, and it says 5,000 men, not counting women and children, had come to Christ, come to faith. He's, he's bold proclaiming of the good news of Jesus. That's snapshot one. Here's a guy boldly proclaiming. A snapshot two of Peter is he's empowered. Uh, he's empowered by God. Um, you know, earlier you see these, the disciples questioning and doubting sometimes, but here they come across a, a lame beggar, and uh, the guy is he's asking Peter and John for money. And Peter says to them, uh, hey, listen, look at us. The lame man looked at him eagerly. He's expecting some money, but Peter says what? He says, I don't have silver or gold to give you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, get up and walk. And what's, what happens? The guy gets up, and he's walking and leaping and praising God. We won't sing the song, but you know, he's going in your head right now. You know, he's, he's walking and leaping and praising God. That's what he's doing. And, and uh, so all the people saw him walking, heard him praising God. And when they realized that it was a lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely uh, astounded by, by what had, had gone on. And the healing was not rooted in Peter's own power. Uh, as he declares in, in Acts 4.10, he says, look, it wasn't me. He says, Listen, let me cl stay clear to all of you and to all the people of Israel. He was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. And so here's a guy who, you know, in times past, he's had doubt, he's struggled, and all this, he's going, look, now he's matured. He's saying, hey, this guy's healed through the power of Jesus, through, through God using Peter. Amazing maturity there. Snapshot three, we're mo moving on. It's that he was a, he wasn't just a bold pro a proclaimer of the good news, he was a fearless, fearless witness at the end of his life. Uh, he's not running away. He's not denying Christ. He's a fearless witness. And you see that when uh, he's proclaiming the, the good news, he's preaching, and the leaders, are they imprison him. They tell him, knock it off, shut up, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And uh, we see that they command him never to, again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And does he say, okay, I better quit because I'm going to be in trouble. He, he, he doesn't do that in his life. He goes out and he says, look, uh, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. And later on in chapter 5, they, they've told him, look, uh, they brought him before the order and they said, we told you never to, uh, we gave you strict orders, never again to teach in this man's name. Instead, you filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him and you want him to make us responsible for his death. And Peter said, what? We must obey God rather than human authority. 
Okay, we're just looking at all these accounts of Peter, just walking through them, and we see he's, he's unafraid. He's fearless. You told me to knock it off, and you're going to imprison you. He says, fine. He goes to jail. He never stops telling other people. That's a mark of a mature believer is a fearless witness. You know, when we're afraid or we're scared, or I'm not going to tell people they might reject me or all these things we come up with. The mature believer says, I don't care. I'm going to fearlessly tell other people. Here's snapshot four, and it comes from late in his life. This is his final words. Peter wrote uh, two, two letters to believers, and in the last letter, the last verse, um, he kind of gives us the, the end goal, the end aim in one sense uh, of, of a life as a Christian. In 2 Peter 3.18, he says, You must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a growing, in, and we talk about his grace, growing in knowledge of who Jesus is, and what? So that all glory is to God. I mean, all glory is uh, to him forever and ever. And that's the aim of his life, you know, that we glorify God. We exist to glorify God, a statement we have in our church. And, and that's what Peter's saying. So he models as a mature believer these marks. These are, these are things that if you look at mature believers, you say, hey, that, I recognize the maturity in them because, you know what, here's what they do. They're b- boldly... They boldly proclaim the good news. Uh, they're unashamed in that way. They're empowered by God. You can see how they work and what they do. They're, there's an empowerment of God in their, in their life, in their ministry. They're a fearless witness, unafraid. And the last thing is they're saying, look, I live uh, growing. I'm constantly growing. I never stop growing. And you see people who are, are my dad's 93. He's still growing like crazy as a weed and his study of the Word of God, and it never stops. They fight the fight, finish the course, keep the faith. That's a mark of a mature believer uh, in, in your life, and, and it exists to glorify God. And, you know, if you, if you look at people like this, sometimes you go, if you, don't, if you didn't know him beforehand, you look at him, you, you come into contact with him, you go, man, this Peter guy, he was like a dynamo. He must have just had gone to all the right schools, and done the right stuff, had a great life, great parents, everything was great. Um, you know, and, and you find out that, no, he went through some serious trials that led him to be mature. I think about uh, people I greatly respect, and I think of, of, uh, of Ruth Polnick. I think of Pastor Roberto. Uh, if you didn't know them, you know, when you, met Ru- when you meet Ruth or you met Roberto, you meet and thought, well, they're my friend. You know, just, there's something about them. There's just a richness and a depth and a love that just overflows in them. And you think, man, the same thing like Peter. I think, well, they just had a great life. They must have had things go well for them. And you look, at some, you talk to Ruth. Ruth doesn't talk about it. But Ruth's dad died, you know, and he was, he was not old, okay? And she lost her dad early. She, she went through an unwanted divorce. She has health issues upon health issues that she has battled. She's been in difficult ministry situations, dealing with the dead, the, the dying. And, and, and yet, you know, all those things combined to make Ruth, she trusted God in and made her this mature believer that, all these things mark her life. Pastor Berto, same thing. Yeah, you know, I, I went to Pastor Berto's front door where he lived, and he grew up in poverty. He didn't grow up in some fancy place with you know easy life. He comes to America and he's terrified. He talks about the first time he flew to America, and he was absolutely so anxious he didn't ever want to fly again sometimes in his life. He always struggled with that. And he had health issues. He had his hearing issue, and he had diabetes, and he had cancer. But through the whole of his life, he said, you know what? I, I, I'm going I'm to walk with God. I'm going to glorify God. And all these marks, same thing. Would, this would mark Pastor Berto's life. It's the mark of any mature believer. That's the aim. That's the goal. That's where we're headed. That's the end product. But it doesn't happen by accident. It happens by, by living the life daily and walking through these, these difficult trials. And so we're going to go back in Peter's life, and we're going to look at how uh, we're going to say, man, man he, we're going to see the goofball stuff, okay? He has great moments and then he just crashes and he does face plants. You're just going, what is this guy thinking? Well, he's like you and he's like me. And, uh, but the end result was this maturity. Snapshot one, okay? We're walking through here and you see uh, Jesus comes along. It's in Luke 5. It's kind of his, it's his beginning. And, and, and Jesus comes along and he, and he wants to speak to the crowd. And there's a boat there and he asks Peter. And Peter pushes it out a little ways. And so Peter, Jesus is speaking from the boat and he's speaking to the crowd. And when he gets done speaking... He tells Peter, hey, let's go out a little further and throw your nets out and on this side and, and uh, do some fishing. And Peter says, hey, we've already been there. We've done that. And, uh, but he says, okay, you say so, whatever. Okay, we'll go out there just to make the guy happy. So they throw out the nets. And what happens? 
The nets are overflowing with fish. I mean, they're, they're, they're bursting at the seams. And, and, and the partners are in another boat. The boats are filled with fish on the verge of sinking. And when Peter says in verse 8 of Luke 5, when Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught and as the others were with him. And, and Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. I mean, he, he's just, he, 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 what the challenge for this situation is to encounter, one lesson, lots of lessons he could learn. We're just going to grab one real quick on each of these. But one of the lessons he learned was, do not question the knowledge or the power of Jesus. When he asks you to do something, say, I, I don't know if they got to work, or does he really know what he's talking about? He's not really a fisherman. Um, don't question the power or the knowledge of Jesus. Just obey what he asks you to do. And it's a challenge for us because we all face situations where, you know, we read the Word of God, you're in a class, you're in a sermon, you hear something on the radio, Christian radio, and you're going, man, I really feel convicted to do this in this situation, a relationship with my finances, with a, a problem I'm having in my life at school or at work or wherever. And then we start kind of processing, going, ah, I don't know if that's really that's probably not a good idea. You know, that doesn't make sense, or I don't know if God will really work in that. And so we can sometimes back off and not obey. Because why? Because we're questioning the power or the knowledge of Jesus. I recently had a situation, a person was challenged in a very uh, difficult situation and interact with them, and, and they chose to obey, even though there could be tremendous ramifications to their life. And, and, and when they went through that, what happened was the miraculous, is God showed up, and God delivered, and God provided in amazing ways through a person saying, you know what, I'm going to follow, I'm going to obey, and they trusted in the knowledge and power of Jesus, and, and God honored that in, a, in incredible ways. It's a reminder uh, of the lesson of Peter, and a reminder for us, in the situations we're facing, where maybe God's called you to something, say, you know what, I need to trust his power, and trust, trust his knowledge and situation. That's one for Peter. Here's a second snapshot of Peter, and the one we're all familiar with. You know, it's the old walking on water thing. You know, Jesus is praying, and he sends them off the lake. He says, hey, you guys go to the other side of the lake. And uh, when they're in the middle of the lake, it's 3 in the morning, it says, and, and things are not going well, okay? And they're starting to flip out. And Jesus comes. He's just, gonna, he's just passing by on the water, you know, just walking on the water. Just read something yesterday about uh, some suggest there was ice that he walked on, you know. <laughs> Whatever. So he's God. He can do what he wants. So he's, he's walking on the water, and um, they see him, but they don't know what it is, and they think it's a ghost, and they're terrified in the situation. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Take courage. Uh, you know, I'm here. It's me. And Peter calls to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus, as we know, says, yeah, come on. Come on. And so Peter, to his credit, he gets out of the boat. And he starts walking on the water. How far, we don't know. But he, he goes, he walks in the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong waves and, and, and the wind, he was terrified and began to sink. He says, save me, Lord. He shouts out. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabs him. And he says, what? You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? You know, it's, uh, it, it's what an incredible moment. You think about Peter. Come on, okay, come on, walk on. And he's, he's actually in faith walking in the water. But then the fear creeps in, and he gets afraid, and he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he doubts. And then he gets rebuked. A great, incredible moment to, ah. Uh, my master said, you know, why'd you doubt? You little, have such little faith. You know, it's a lesson learned uh, in faith that I think when Peter became mature, and he's, here he is, he's, he, God's using him to heal this layman. He had faith. He believed in the power of God. He didn't doubt, and God used him. And, and, and that's, that's a challenge for us. You know, I, I read here, I'm just going to read you the story about a, a guy stepping out of the boat, if you will. His name is Gary Haugen, and he's the founder of International Justice Mission. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a ministry that reaches out to those involved in, in challenging, um, freeing people of sex trafficking and trying to work against those who are doing that. And he says this, I vividly remember... 
when I finally had to make a decision to abandon my career at the U.S. Department of Justice to become the first employee of a nonprofit organization that didn't yet actually exist called International Justice Mission. I'd worked for three years with friends on the idea of, he calls it IJM, and was very excited in theory about this dream of following Jesus in the work of justice in the world. But then I had to actually act. I had to walk into the Department of Justice and turn in my badge. I tried to be very brave and very safe. That is to say, I walked in and asked my bosses for a year-long leave of absence. My bosses politely declined. I was suddenly feeling very nervous. What was I really afraid of? As I thought about it, I feared humiliation. If my little justice ministry idea didn't work, no one was going to die. If IJM turned out to be a bad idea and collapsed, my kids weren't going to starve. We'd probably just have to live with my parents for a while until I could find another job. But my education, with my education, odds are I would find a job soon. The fact is, I would be terribly, terribly embarrassed. Having told everyone about my great idea, they would know that it was a bad idea or that I was a bad leader. Either way, it would be humiliating. So there it was, my boundary of fear. I sensed God invited me to an extraordinary adventure of service, but deep inside, I was afraid of looking like a fool and a loser. This was actually very helpful to see because it helped me get past it. When I am older, do I really want to look back and say, yeah, I sense that God was calling me to lead a movement to bring rescue to people who desperately need an advocate in the world, but I was afraid of getting embarrassed, and so I never tried. Fear is normal, even among the earnest and devout, and it can be overcome, but first we must see the opportunity it provides, a revelation that only comes as we step out of the precipice, on the precipice of action, until we step out of the boat. I mean, all of us, all of us have fears. All of us have anxiety when God calls us something. And that's, if you know the book Experiencing God, the challenge there is, you know, you seek where God's working and you join him in that encounter and it takes a step of faith. There's always a cost in, involved in, in that. Um, you know, so that's snapshot too. Is he learns through, he learns faith through the situation. Here's snapshot three. And again, he has this great high moment followed by this major crash, uh, face plant. And, and it's in Matthew 16. And it's where Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, man, this is, this is true. You're blessed, Simon, son of John, because the Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. He goes on and says, upon this Rock, I'm going to build my church. And I mean, what a great moment. And then right after this, you know, uh, Jesus starts to declare to them what's going to happen to him. He's telling plainly, uh, you know, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to terrible things at the hands of elders and leading priests and teachers. And I'm going to be killed. On the third day, I'll be raised up from the dead. And Peter, Peter then says, takes Jesus' side and begins to reprimand Jesus. And for saying such things, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turns to him and says, what? Get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. That's an incredible lesson that I think Peter grabs again as he goes along to realize, okay, am I looking at this situation, whatever he faced in the future, imprisonment, a witness, healing, am I seeing this from my perspective or am I seeing it from God's perspective? That's the challenge that he has, and that's a challenge for, for each of us in situations we face. I, I know all of us, we have situations, whether it's, again, you go back to relationships or finances or jobs or, uh, you know, forgiveness is a common stumbling block where we, we see it from our perspective and not from God's. Someone wronged us, someone has hurt us, and so revenge, well, that sounds good. You know, retribution, why not? You know, shunning and shaming, well, that sounds like a good idea. From our perspective, that makes sense. We have all kinds of logical reasons why we should do that. But from God's perspective, he says what? He says, forgive as you have been forgiven by me. And we're going, uh, but what about the justice? What about, what, what, what about this? What about that? And he says, there's no, there's no buts in the situation. Um, you know, it's, it's forgive. You know, some years back, I, I was reading this. It was like 2009. I think I shared it. It was about a pastor in, I think it was Illinois, um, First Baptist Church, Fred Winters. 
And he was shot and killed in a morning service, Sunday service, by a deranged, young, uh, troubled man. And a week after the event, his wife, Cindy Winters, she went uh, on CBS Early Show, and she was asked about her husband's alleged killer, Terry Sedlicek, something like that. And uh, she spoke only of a message of forgiveness. This is, what, this is what she said a week after her husband has been shot in a morning worship service. I do not have any hatred or even hard feelings towards him. We have been praying for him. One of the first things my daughter said to me after this happened was, you know, I hope that he comes to learn to love Jesus through all of this. We are not angry at all, and we really firmly believe that he can find hope and forgiveness and peace through this by coming to know Jesus. And we hope that that happens for him. Really? Now, that's a mature believer in Jesus Christ who sees things from God's perspective, not her own. Because if it was our perspective, well, we'd say, hang him high. We'd say, take him out. Justice, vengeance, I hope he rots. That would be the natural response. But when we see things from God's perspective, as she did, she's saying, I hope he comes to know Jesus. I hope he knows the love and forgiveness and grace of Jesus. That, that's, that's a challenge for each of us. In, uh, we see in, in, in Peter's life, uh, as a challenge, challenge for us to see not from our perspective, but from God's perspective. Snapshot four, another, another flop and failure here. With, he has a great moment and, and a crash and burn. You know, he goes up in, in Matthew 26, and Jesus, uh, he goes up to the olive grove with these guys, and he says, he tells them, sit here. And, and while I go over there and pray, he took Peter and, and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished. Jesus is anguished, and he's distressed. And he told him, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. That's their job. You just keep, you stay here and you pray, and I'm going to go away. So Jesus goes away and he prays, and then he comes back, and what's Peter, James, and John doing? They're snoring. They're sleeping. And, and Jesus he returns and he finds him asleep. He says, could you watch with me even an hour? Keep watching and pray so that you will not give in to temptations for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. One simple request. So he goes away again. He comes back snoozing. Goes away again, comes back snoozing. Uh, you know, here they are. Three guys have the privilege, the honor of being in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says, and the, the privilege of having the master, the Lord, of life saying, would you just keep watch for me? Would you just pray for me? I am just overwhelmed with anguish. Yeah, we got it. No problem. You know, wow. Crash and burn. But you know what? I think that lesson impacted Peter. It had to have. Because later in his life, when he's writing his letters, he gives this exhortation. Uh, and as Paul gave the exhortation, be on watch, keep on guard. But Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The next to last verse, uh, the last, next to last words we hear from Peter is in 2 Peter 3, 17. He says, so be on guard. He's saying, hey, people are going to try to lead you astray. Be on guard. Then you'll not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Watch out. Be alert. Stay on guard, you know, in these situations. And Peter knew from personal experience the danger of letting down those that uh, you love most. You know, it's a good question for us to ask ourselves is, you know, how am, how am I doing in my own guarding, protecting, keeping watch over my spiritual life? Do I, do I just bounce along and just go through life? Or do I really say, man, I need to be on guard. I need to watch out. I need to be careful. This situation, that person, my spiritual life, my walk with God, my time in the Word, my prayer life, am I guarding that? And beyond that, am I on guard and in prayer? As Ephesians 6 tells us, for all believers, for, other, for people in our church family who are endangered and struggling do we pray for them? We just go, oh, hey, good to see you, good to see you, and that's the last we think about it. It's, it's an important challenge for us. Snapshot five. Here we go. Snapshot five. And here's, uh, here's again, we know these stories, most of us. You know, Peter's there, and Jesus is telling him, look, you, you know, I'm going to go through these things, and you're all going to desert me. You're going to disappear, and 
you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, no nah, way, not me. That's not happened. I will never desert you. Matthew 26, 33, 34, Jesus says, you know what? I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times that you even know me. No, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. So we know Peter denies once, twice, three times, rooster crows, and poof, he realizes what's happened. Suddenly Jesus' words flash through Peter's mind, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And he went away weeping bitterly, weeping bitterly. And what's the lesson? I mean, there's many lessons, again, from all these, but one of them, I think, is there's, there's, be humble. He's very proud. Well, I'm not going to deny you. Not me. These rest of these losers might, but not me. I'm going to die with you. And that night, I don't know him. What are you talking about? I wasn't around him. Are you kidding me? It's, it's the, I think, when, again, you look at Peter's life, and he, you look at his writing, and you see these lessons. He learned back here in his maturity. This is what he writes in 1 Peter 5. Look at this. All of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God at the right time. He will lift you up in honor. Peter understands the price of pride. He understands that how it can bring downfall personally. And, and, and so it's a challenge for us, again, to look at our lives and say, okay, you know, is there an area I'm being prideful that you know, I'm going to say, that would never happened to me. Well, I'd never go there. Galatians 6 tells us, you know, hey, you, you who are spiritual, you know, you know, restore such people. Be careful unless you yourselves may fall. This requires humility in our lives. Snapshot 6. I know we're cruising through these, but these are important lessons to see where they end up in maturity in his life. And this is his commission and to, to ministry, okay? Uh, Peter's come. He's there with Jesus and John chapter 21, and after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love these, me more than these? And yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. He repeats the same question. Simon, son of, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Take care of my sheep. A third time he asks him, which I find fascinating. I was telling you earlier this week, it's fascinating to me. Uh, he denies Jesus three times. He falls asleep three times. And Jesus, for whatever reason, I don't know what the reason is, but for three times he asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And yes, and by this time, Peter's hurt when he's asked this third time, that Jesus is asking the question a third time. You know everything. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. And Jesus told him, follow me. I mean, what a mountaintop moment, you know? Follow me. Yeah, I'll follow you. Yes, I, you know, I mean, he, you know I love you. You know I'm going to follow you. And, and uh, his response, you know, right after that, he, does he say, you know, I'm going to follow you to the ends of the earth? Does he just say simple, very short, yes, Lord, I'll follow you? Or does he get real verbose and say, you know, it doesn't matter whether mountains or snow or rain or oceans, I am with you all the way. Nothing can stop me from following you. He doesn't do that. What does he do right after this great moment? He turns around and he sees John, the one who Jesus loved the one who asked another question about who was going to deny him, and he says, well, what, what, what's, going to, what's, what's going on with John? What are you with John? He just commissioned him, feed my sheep, follow me, okay, but what about John? You know, and, and Jesus says, you know what, if, you, if, you want, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. And in other words, it's none of your business, you know? Your job is to follow me, and don't worry about John or Doug or Steve or Sally or Betty, don't worry about them. It's you and me, and that's what you need to be concerned about. You know, it's, I don't know if it's curiosity in this part. I don't know if it's a pecking order. Where do we kind of stand? You know, he seemed kind of close to you, and he leaned on you. Or I, I'm not really sure. What's, what's with John? Uh, you know, uh, it can happen in our lives. And, uh, and the lesson so much is, you know, don't worry about what God's doing to other people. Do what God's called you to do. This was a huge lesson in my life. Years ago, when I was ministering, not here, and I was struggling, and I found myself being very uh, judgmental and saying, well, this guy's not doing this, and I'm doing this, and he's not doing this, and I'm doing this, and he's doing that, and I'm not doing that. And I became very pharisaical. I'm sure glad I'm not like that sinner over there. And it, I've shared before, it took my spiritual life down the drain. 
And I became very judgmental, very critical, and it, it affected the whole of my life until it came to that point where I realized, okay, God just opened my eyes to see, you know what, you don't need to worry about anybody else. you got enough sin of your own to worry about. And so just fix your eyes on me and thank you, be thankful for the grace that I have given you. And it was transforming. So I, I don't know if you find yourself in a situation where, you know, you maybe have a great moment and you turn around and you're worried about what other believers are doing or not doing, or they're not doing this, but I, I sure am. You know, I'm... I'm you know, it's, it's a pitfall. And so from, from Peter's situation, we can learn, and do the job that you have before you, don't, don't question. So we got, we got six, six uh, snapshots, okay? We walked through these. I know we just talked Peter, Peter, Peter. Uh, not, okay, so anyway, so we look at this, and here's our, here's our lessons we learned, okay? Uh, these can lead to maturity. Don't question or doubt knowledge of power of Jesus. You know, when you look at Peter's life, he, he questioned doubt early on. Not late in his life. We see a second thing that happens is he says, you know, step out in faith. And, uh, you know, we have situations where God's called us, and sometimes we're fearful, sometimes we question, sometimes we doubt. He's saying, don't do that. Just step out of the boat. Seek God's perspective. Situation you're facing, I don't know what you're facing, but my guess is a lot of times we look at our perspective, and we don't seek God's counsel. We don't look to the Word of God. We don't turn, if you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. We don't turn to wise, godly people and say, what do you think about this? How should I deal with that? Or if we do, we say, man, that's just their opinion. I think I've think I got a better look on this. It's saying, you know what? Seek God's perspective in circumstances, situations. Keep uh, on watch, be on guard with your spiritual life and those of others. Say, what am I doing to guard myself? You know, bad company corrupts good morals, uh, you know, it's, it's so many different things of being in the Word, being around godly people, all those things of being on guard, watching. Be humble. Uh, we saw in the situation, pride goes before the fall. And the sixth snapshot we had is do the work God has given you. Don't worry about what other people are doing or not doing. I mean, all these things are, this is when Peter was growing and all these situations, which all of us are doing, all of us are going through. And if we allow them, they can help us to grow, to become mature, and, and walking with God. If we apply these lessons to our lives, um, you know, however God's taken us through it. And otherwise, you know, if we don't take this and we don't apply it, uh, it has no impact. It can be, uh, we just hear, oh, that's nice. We heard a lot of lessons about Peter today. Well, that was cool. You know, that's not the aim. The aim is that we, we find uh, life chase in, in, our, in our walk w- with God. Um, you know, I, um, I know all of us, you know, think, well, Peter messed up. Well, all of us go through these situations, and times we wonder, I can't believe God even forgives me. I can't believe God even loves me for how I've lived my life. And, and the blessing and the encouragement is, when we're going through these ups and downs, you see Peter, God used Peter in amazing ways later on in his life as he matured, and, and along the way. And so for us, we're going through the battle, we're going through the struggle, we're not we're failing, falling on our face. Be, be encouraged, because God can, can use us in, in great ways. But like I say, the insight uh, that we've learned is, is no value unless we apply it. So here's, here's the challenge, okay? And it's just kind of your homework um, is to say, okay, I need to look at my life. What are the snapshots in my life back here or right now that I'm going through that I'd say, okay, what is God doing And in trials and tribulations and struggles and relationships, all these things? What's God doing? And how, how is, can God use that to... Uh, to bring maturity in my life. You go back, you go back to, to James chapter 1. I'm going to come back where we started. In James chapter 1, it says this, you know, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, it doesn't say if they do, they will come. They're going to come. Consider an opportunity for great joy, for you know when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. This is new living. You know, it's out of various trials, knowing the testing your faith can produce endurance. It, it has a chance to grow in, in that way. Uh, so let it grow. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's up to how we respond. I can say this, this situation stinks. I'm not going to forgive. I'm not going to grow. I'm not, this is horrible and all these circumstances. Or we can say, I'm going to allow them to let them grow me to be the, the person of God that God has called me to be. I, my fear today was you come and you hear all these stories about Peter, and you go, well, that was interesting. And, and that's not the aim. The aim is to look at these stories and encounters and see a guy who was mature at the end of his life say, I want to be that person over there. I want to be mature and godly and growing and, and be a bold witness for the good news. I want to be uh, empowered by God, be a fearless witness, growing 
in knowledge and, 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 uh, and, and power of Jesus, always glorifying God. That's the end aim. So what's it going to take in our lives? That's the challenge. Consider in your life, what is it that I need to do over here to end up the end aim over here? Walking by his grace, which is enough. Living in his power, which is enough. Living under his knowledge, which is enough. So that we can be conformed to his image, his likeness individually, and as a church family as a whole. I want us to pray, and I want you to really think about and examine your life and just say, okay, what is it that I need to address so that I can move from this snapshot to maturity snapshot? Uh, and, and if you failed and f- fumbled, that's, that's, that's a great place to be. You guys look at Peter over and over and over again until he, he continued to walk with God and learned lessons through that. So we're going to pray, and then we'll close with a, we'll close with a song. Let's, let's pray. God, we, we come today and we, we look at the life of Peter and we learn how you work through one great moment and one failure after another. And Lord, we, we thank you for, for this man's life and the, the new beginning you gave him at the seemingly the end of his life uh, after all these ups and downs and all arounds. And we pray right now. We pray in our own situations. I know there are people in this room who are in the thick of a tough situation and wondering, what in the world are you doing? May they learn through the situation they're facing. Because, Lord, these are Peter's lessons. They're not necessarily ours. Lord, you have a lesson for each one of us, and we know that. And so may we humble ourselves before you, and may you teach us. May you grow us. May you conform us to your image and your likeness through um, our trusting you through the trials we face. So just you and God, we just take a time to reflect and say, God, um, I, need, I need to uh, deal, deal with this. I need to address this. I want to grow and mature. What is it for you? Uh, out of all these lessons, uh, what is it for you you need to uh, address and take on? Just you and God for just a, a moment. Lord, this day we thank you for your word, and we pray that you will find us faithful, and Lord, that you will grow us to be the people you've called us to be. We, we um, rejoice in your, your forgiveness and your love, and restoring us to newness and growing us. May, uh, may we bring glory to you. May we continually grow in, in your knowledge and your power. In your name we ask. Amen.